today's presenter, Ed Jones. Thanks, Samantha. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this discussion on HIPAA Safeguard Training uh, Curriculum for Privacy and Security Officials, uh, a new simplified but effective approach for training. Uh, this will be released on our website as part of the HIPAA Integrity Risk Analysis Template and Policies and Procedures Compliance Tools um, uh, later this month. Let's see how I can get the slides going here. Uh, today's focus, uh, we're going to be covering um, three important components of safeguard uh, training, uh, HIPAA privacy administrative requirements, HIPAA security, and the High Tech Act breach notification. It's designed for covered entity and business associate privacy and security officials to train their workforce members. Included with link to and it utilizes the HIPAA integrity risk analysis and safeguard policies and procedures a compliance text and our video tools. It provides only essential concepts in a simplified format that lead to affecting change in workforce awareness and understanding of safeguards and to creating a more secure working environment. Uh, this is based upon uh, what we've learned from our clients and uh, working with all sorts of covered entities and business associates. Uh, we, found, we have found that safeguard training helps your workforce avoid costly uh, mistakes and if you've read any of the uh, resolution agreements uh, from OCR, you'll find in the correct, uh, corrective action plans uh, that training is uh, one of the most important components along with policies and procedures. Uh, we also will be making available later um, uh, question and answers in true-false multiple choice for uh, measuring and documenting awareness and understanding. Uh, our curriculum is prevent, presented in five uh, lessons that can be taught in a single seminar or sessions over several staff meetings and uh, each session uh, relates with one exception which I'll get into later uh, about 20 minutes of time uh, in a staff meeting or over a two-hour course of a seminar. Trained workforce members have a common interest in supporting and reinforcing each other in safeguarding protected health information from unauthorized use, disclosure, uh, or access. The probability of a costly breach is less when each trained workforce member and a covered entity or business associate has the same awareness and understanding of those policies and procedures. It's also uh, required uh, by federal law that all uh, workforce members be trained who are using uh, protected health information. Since the uh, omnibus rule that went into effect in September of 2013, the Insurance Services Office no longer covers under uh, commercial general liability policies, HIPAA or High Tech Act breaches. So uh, additional cybersecurity uh, coverages are needed and increasingly those insurance companies are requiring documentation of risk analysis policies and procedures to mitigate risk and safeguard training. Excuse me, I'm having problems with the... Uh... In moving the uh, screens, there we go. Today's focus, um, the most difficult part of implementing information protection is people. Security is ultimately a people problem, not a technology issue. People don't always understand the value of the healthcare data they access, but healthcare organizations can remedy this issue by educating and training the people who collect, use, store, and share that information. In doing this, healthcare IT can ensure that employees are aware of the value of their data and therefore more inclined to take the extra steps to protect that data and ensure adversaries are not able to intercept it. Training is crucial.
today's agenda, I'm going to go pretty quickly through lesson one and lesson two. I use references FR for Federal Register and CFR for Code of Federal Regulations. Um, and there are uh, sites throughout that you can get additional information. Just. Uh, lesson two is focusing on educational principles and definitions, and um, these are absolutely crucial. Sometimes we look at this in a much broader context. We've uh, gotten it down to what really are essential. Then I'm going to highlight the last three lessons and uh, show you what it um, covers. Lesson one is a broad overview. We have found in dealing with a number of uh, clients and on visitation to covered entity and business associate locations that there is insufficient knowledge about what is really driving uh, safeguard training in the HIPAA and High Tech Act context. Um, so we start at a very high level and go down um, to show what is important in terms of uh, dealing um, with the training attributes. There are three enabling uh, regulations. There's uh, the privacy standards, these date to 2003, the security standards that date to 2005, and breach notification that went into effect in September of uh, 2009, but enforcement was delayed until February of 2010. Uh, interestingly, if you've been in business that long and you have not dealt uh, with these issues, then we've had a breakdown of communication and education. And it's important now with OCR just ready to begin their uh, uh, desk audits for compliance as well as in investigations for uh, a breach and complaints. Uh, that everyone needs, every business associate and covered entity needs to have uh, this document documentation available. The modifications of the final rule, uh, they went into effect in September of 2013. Uh, you'll get the slide deck, so these URLs, you can access uh, any of those uh, uh, documents. Lesson one is uh, focusing on safeguard compliance and the mission for covered entities and business associates is to secure protected health information so, no, so it's not impermissibly accessed, disclosed, or used by unauthorized persons or processes. The evidence at a high level is the really six things that need to be done. Uh, every entity needs to designate a privacy and security official for small entities, so it can be the same uh, person, to manage safeguard efforts and ensure ongoing vigilance. You have to conduct and periodically review and update an analysis of risks, which would be threats and vulnerabilities to PHI. You have to implement, identify and implement risk mitigation strategies for safeguarding um, the information, those are based on findings from the risk analysis. You have to train your workforce members on those policies and procedures, and importantly, those policies and procedures have to be accessible uh, to them. Since we're dealing in an electronic environment today, uh, we can facilitate that and use those uh, for training. And you have to have in place uh, and apply sanctions for safeguard violations. Finally, everything has to be documented, all activities, actions, and assessments uh, relating to uh, risk analysis, policies, and procedures, and training. It's important to understand the basic definitions. A number of people that we've spoken to really don't understand what a policy is. So we've used these definitions. It's a definite course or method of action selected from among alternatives and in light of given conditions to guide and determine present and future decisions, and, or a high-level overall plan embracing the general goals and acceptable procedures, especially of a government body. So these are the course of actions that uh, every covered entity and business associate uh, must take. 
and then a procedure associated with each uh, policy or set of policies is the steps that you're actually going to take to accomplish the uh, goal of protecting the information. Both uh, HIPAA privacy and security rules and the High Tech Act uh, rule require policies and procedures to be in writing. Uh, they can be in electronic form, which we recommend. And they have to be accessible to all covered entity and business associate workforce members. Why do we want to invest in safeguard compliance? Um, evidence is readily available in the event of a compliance audit or an investigation pertaining to a privacy breach, security incident, or complaint investigation. Uh, if any of those occur, you're going to have a very short period of time to prove that those policies and procedures were in place. Also, it's important to avoid significant financial penalties, which under the modified um, uh, High Tech Act of uh, the HIPAA rules uh, now takes it up to 50000 per violation and $1.5 million per calendar year for a repeat of the same violation. Uh, those were raised from $100 per violation and $25,000 over a calendar year for a repeat. Increasingly, um, cybersecurity insurers, as I have said, have uh, demanded uh, for issuance or renewal of policies a uh, documentation. And re recent breaches, such as uh, the massive attack on Anthem, uh, in 2015, which affected just under 80 million individuals, uh, have caused underwriters to intensify their uh, scrutiny of cyber risks. And I have uh, been on the phone with a number of underwriters in recent days uh, uh, discussing this uh, as well. And they are uh, particularly concerned with uh, re-emerging costly threats such as uh, last month's uh, ransomware threat at Hollywood, California Presbyterian uh, Medical Center, where a ransom was demanded to uh, provide access, free access to uh, uh, that group's data. Excuse me. Um, we've also had a number of failures. Um, we've had um, 710 reports of large breaches that affected uh, about 22 and a half million individuals since September of 09. Uh, those were in just the period 2011, 2012, which is the last report that OCR has sent to the Congress. And um, there have been uh, 77,000 breaches of less than 500 individuals, and most of those are significantly under 500 affecting uh, 378,000 individuals. Uh, there have been 1,470 major breaches. Uh, this was reported uh, about 10 days ago. Um, since September of 29, and 11% of those were due to hacking, affecting 115 million individuals' medical records. Of those records hacked, 97% occurred in 2015 so the problem is worsening. Uh, these are generally outside threats uh, into electronic systems. And four of the five largest healthcare data breaches occurred uh, last year. And the costs are uh, uh, quite high. The average cost for a loss or stolen record uh, increased from $145 in 2014 to 154 in the uh, study for 2015, uh, and those cover a variety of costs to remediate a breach. Uh, but in healthcare, it can be even much higher, up to $363 uh, dollars per medical record breach based upon uh, survey data. And those costs, as I said, cover all aspects of uh, remediation. So the, the principles in safeguard enforcement are um, covered entities and business associates have the burden of proof of demonstrating compliance. They're required to cooperate with uh, HHS, uh, Health and Human Services, 
and increasingly with state attorneys general at the uh, state level, which was uh, authorized under uh, the High Tech Act. Uh, HHS, in turn, will provide in assistance. Uh, they're not out there to be punitive, but they do want to uh, have compliance, so uh, they will assist. And uh, in the absence or in particular egregious cases, a resolution agreement, corrective action plans, uh, if there's a determination of willful neglect not corrected, uh, and examples are at that URL, and some of the fines are quite high, such as the $4.8 million uh, paid by uh, New York Presbyterian and Columbia University Medical Center last year. Compliance reviews um, are going to, as I mentioned, um, uh, be started uh, if there's any uh, evidence and it could come from a complaint uh, or it could be just a random solicitation of information, um, but they're going to be particularly interested in willful neglect. And um, you can go to the uh, website, there's a site later uh, that will give you a lot of information on uh, how they're going to conduct these. Um, they're going to be checking to make sure that uh, you are in compliance and uh, you're required to permit access to HHS during normal business hours or at any time if there's uh, evidence of exigent circumstances. And there have been several cases uh, where that has occurred. Uh, and later this month, uh, OCR is expected to begin those desk audit compliance reviews. Privacy and breach notification uh, applicability is to um, both business associates and covered entities and standard training um, that is required in these administrative requirements is a covered entity and business associate must train all members of its workforce on the policies and procedures with respect to protected health information required by the privacy and breach notification rules is necessary and appropriate for the members to carry out their functions. Um, these are implementation uh, specifications and what it says is it has to go, training must be done by each member, each new member of the workforce must be trained. Uh, Texas has a state law that requires each new member to be trained within uh, 30 days and for all members to be retrained uh, on a recurring basis every two years. And any time there is a material change in policies or procedures or in terms of the uh, rules, uh, the regulatory rules, uh, there has to be retraining uh, on those and everything must be documented. So uh, in the uh, omnibus rule um, uh, preamble, uh, the statement, we emphasize the importance of ensuring that all workforce members are appropriately trained and knowledgeable about what constitutes a breach and on the policies and procedures for reporting, analyzing, documenting a possible breach of unsecured protected health information. You'll find in uh, when I get near the end uh, that we believe uh, this can be accomplished uh, rather more simply than having everyone uh, know everything about uh, the content uh, of the particular regulations. The security uh, training rules in these date back to 2005 is to prevent, detect, contain, and correct security violations pertaining to unauthorized access, disclosure, or use of electronic protected health information. The privacy and breach notification rules cover protected health information in hard copy, oral, and electronic format. The security rule covers it only in electronic format. The applicability, um, it now requires since uh, September of uh, 2013 that all business associates uh, have their workforce members trained on all aspects of the security rule and that includes even subcontractors who are all uh, business associates who are also uh, business associates. Uh, the actual standard for security, implement a security awareness and training program for all members of the workforce, including management. 
and they have four implementation specification security reminders uh, periodically protection from malicious software uh, guarding and reporting malicious software that may be uh, a threat coming in from the outside it could be a vulnerability internally if uh, workforce members were using their own uh, devices without protection uh, procedures for monitoring login attempts and reporting uh, discrepancies so this uh, relates to a number of technological uh, aspects of the software uh, in terms of access uh, to electronic protected health information devices and systems and then password uh, management this is to authenticate authorization of uh, someone's ability to use the information that those comprise the first uh, lesson kind of a broad overview and again, as I said at the beginning, uh, there is a lot of misinformation and a lot of uh, lack of knowledge uh, about what these safeguards, why they arise, where they come from, and what's the authorization. The second lesson, and this gets into focusing on some very important properties, really properties across the privacy breach, notification, and security rule. Uh, and these are essential for uh, understanding uh, by workforce members. And the first are uh, three uh, principles that come out of the security rule. Uh, and these need to really be uh, embodied in behavior. Uh, confidentiality, the property that data or information are not made available or disclosed to unauthorized person or processes integrity that the data or information have not been altered or destroyed in an unauthorized manner and availability is the data or information accessible and usable upon demand by an authorized person this this really is an umbrella and it also covers uh, privacy um, uh, and a breach in terms of other types of non-electronic PHI so um, these are really the foundation of the, the knowledge base that we want all workforce members to have is to embody those uh, principles in their behavior and how they deal with uh, uh, protected health information. So it's important that these uh, are learned, uh, the data are unavailable to unauthorized users, uh, data are accessible to authorized users at any time, and the data are not uh, altered or destroyed without authorization. It's important that we not get into the weeds in terms of the regulations. I think this has been a problem in, in having uh, training really take hold and be effective, particularly as uh, breaches and security instances seem to be um, occurring more and more. But uh, what we also want to drive is that any question by a workforce member as to authorization pertaining to these principles or understanding of the principles should be referred immediately to the security official. There are also there are a number of definitions. There are um, well over 100 definitions uh, pertaining to each of these rules, but there are 14 key definitions that we want uh, trainees to focus on and I'm going to cover the ones in red today uh, the others are there uh, and in the uh, uh, data set uh, we give the URLs for all these uh, definitions but it's important to focus and understand uh, what the ones in, in red are because there's a lot of misunderstanding a, a lot of people think workforce is only employees it covers anyone who's under the direct control of a covered entity or business associate. So it could be an intern or a volunteer, and they have to be trained as well. In the federal uh, ARGOT, person is not just a human being, but it covers a whole variety in terms of the use of the word, it covers trust or estate, partnerships, corporations, professional associations or corporations, or other entities, public or private. So you'll see that term. Uh, quite a bit, so it, it covers uh, all of those in terms of protecting uh, data. 
protective, uh, protected health information um, is individually identifiable health information that's transmitted by electronic media, maintained in electronic media, or transmitted or maintained in any other form uh, or media. So that could be oral conversations, uh, could be hard copy uh, x-rays. It excludes uh, particular types of identifiable health information. I'm only going to uh, point out two of these. Uh, I, which is, uh, there's a, and I get lots of calls on these, on immun immunization records. Those are also covered once they leave a physician's office by what's called the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA. So if they're in a nurse's office in uh, a school, they're not covered under HIPAA, they're covered under FERPA. The last one down here is new uh, in the modifications, and that has to do with uh, records have to be uh, sacrosanct and protected for 50 years after a person uh, is deceased. A designated record set is um, where a person's records are uh, kept as a group in a hospital, maybe the medical record or in a physician's office, the insurance claim file, um, et cetera. This term designated record set uh, is important, uh, particularly for privacy and security officials as to where records are and who has access and so forth. So it's a, it's a term to uh, know. This is the uh, other uh, important aspect. There are 18 identifiers of protected health information, and if all of them are absent, uh, then it's de-identified data and it's no longer covered under HIPAA. There's some rules surrounding this, but it's important that everyone understand uh, what these 18 identifiers are. And they're listed here, names, geographic subdivisions, a whole variety of dates, telephone numbers, fax numbers, email addresses, social security numbers, et cetera, license numbers, URLs, IP addresses, finger and voice prints, photographic images, or any other unique identifying number, characteristic, or code um, pertaining to the individual except as permitted. And the only permission there is for uh, statisticians who would be um, uh, working with the data. Um, but the, these are important to know, those principles. Um, so any of these 18 identifiers required for de-identification, any one of them can pinpoint the identity of an individual um, in a designated record set at a healthcare provider in an insurance file or in the custody of a healthcare clearinghouse or business associate working on behalf of a covered entity. So those are what uh, be, comprise a protected health information in association with medical information. The last uh, definition here that we'll talk about is unsecured protected health information. And this is important in terms of uh, breach notification, but it means protected health information that is not rendered unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable to unauthorized persons use of a technology or methodology specified by the secretary. And that methodology is down, described down here. It's the guidance to render unsecured protected health information unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable to unauthorized individuals. This was uh, promulgated originally in April of 2009. It was in a uh, interim final rule in August of that year, and it has not been changed. It's available at that uh, URL, and what's important is it specifies the permissible encryption under NIST specifications, that's the National Institute of Standards and Technology, that provides a safe harbor for breach notification uh, if the electronic protected health information is secure and not accessible to unauthorized persons. The reason this is important and it's an imperative now in training is that a number of devices, smartphones, tablets, portable devices, uh, carry uh, protected health information and are used outside of uh, a workstation 
uh, environment in a, in a covered entity or business associate facility. And it's important that those data be encrypted. And if they are according to the safe harbor rules, uh, then it's not a breach notification if the device is lost or stolen, which many are. So in a summary of lesson two, uh, the workforce member must know with certainty and understand the three foundational principles and 14 critical definitions for safeguarding protected health information. Now it's an introduction to lessons three to five. Um, the HIPAA privacy rule, there are 14 implementation specifications uh, with regard to administrative requirements. There are a number, as you can see, related to administrative safeguards, uh, and in the administrative are uh, business associate agreement requirements, physical safeguards, technical safeguards, and compliance protocols. And finally, with the High Tech Act breach notification rule, there are 18 of these. So there are 92 safeguard written policies and procedures that are required. Uh, we've written them all in a broad general format and they're ready to be tailored by findings from a covered entity or business associates risk analysis. And those policies and procedures are now tied into uh, the training protocols that we've um, uh, developed. And uh, workforce members, as I mentioned earlier, are required to have access to those policies and procedures. This represents um, the content that we have and the linkage are in that first column, uh, as you'll see here and in just a minute with the others. Uh, and they list all of the standards, implementation uh, requirements and required forms, which are in the fourth category. There are four of these I want to uh, focus on. And those are complaints to the covered entity sanctions, refraining from intimidating or retaliatory acts, and waiver of rights. Um, all of those, uh, but particularly D, G, and H, have to be embodied in the notice of privacy practices uh, that any uh, covered entity or uh, business associate uh, would have. And it's important when you talk about business associates, while they're required to have the same uh, security policies and procedures, uh, that a covered entity would have a business associate in terms of the privacy uh, rule is those are defined in the business associate agreement so they're much more limited than the broad um, privacy rule and they just specify the work functions that the business associate are going to handle so uh, those would have to be uh, specified but um, it's important that these four, and sanctions as well, uh, be well understood by um, uh, every workforce uh, member. Uh, OCR takes very seriously uh, a, a lack of uh, a covered entity in particular uh, uh, infringing on any of these rights of a uh, patient. I think we've covered that. Yeah. Um, the security rule, as I said, comprises administrative, fiscal, and technical safeguards. Covered entities and business associates are required to have uh, uh, these rules in place. They have flexibility with regard to inputs as long as they attain the uh, protections, which are outputs. Uh, so uh, with one exception, it's technologically neutral. To, uh, go over that in a sec. It's, uh, the security rule is scalable and flexible, taking into consideration size and structure of business, cost of security measures, probability and criticality of risks, the threats and vulnerabilities, and is technologically uh, neutral with one exception, and that is the choice of encryption for data at rest in a database or in transmission, data in motion in a transmission. Uh, has to meet the uh, rules specified in the guidance that I gave you the URL for uh, earlier. Key physicians of the security rule are implemented through policies and procedures uh, based on uh, defined standards and implementation specifications 
and from the findings from a written risk analysis that's periodically uh, updated. I mentioned uh, earlier that it is people-driven rather than technology-driven, but for those covered entities participating in the Meaningful Use uh, Program for Adoption of Certified Electronic uh, Record Technologies, uh, we've developed concordances between the HIPAA rules and the uh, Meaningful Use uh, Risk Analysis and more technological requirements uh, for stage one and two, and those are included in uh, the uh, HIPAA integrity package. All safeguard policies and procedures and actions related to them must be documented with documentation retained from, for six years. These are uh, using the same type of format, uh, the coding, the, the standards, column two, implementation specifications, and forms, and there are 22 required forms that need to be maintained on a uh, basis for either maintenance or authorization. Uh, I'll just go through these. Uh, these are all of them. Um, and you can look at them uh, in detail. In the previous webinars, I've gone through uh, these in more uh, depth, and we've done uh, videos on these practicums on uh, implementing these as well. Uh, and these are the uh, policies, procedures, and documentation uh, requirements. So in lesson four, um, we're recommending that the covered entity or business associate provide an electronic copy of the tailored security rule policies and procedures to each workforce member for reading prior to the training seminar or staff meeting session uh, for lesson four. These can all be distributed uh, electronically, and it's important that every workforce member to meet that accessibility requirement just read these through so they have a general understanding uh, of them. Security officials should describe at a high level the intent of each policy procedure combination in securing a PHI and ask for any questions to ensure there is understanding of the safeguards. Again, the security official should emphasize that a workforce member who discovers or becomes aware of a security incident should report it immediately to the security official. Security officials should highlight access and use authorization specified in each workforce member's job description and the sanctions for noncompliance, and should maintain a safeguard training attendance log that is included with the, uh, we include that uh, in the policies and, and uh, procedures. That is one of the uh, things along with, um, uh, we include the OCR audit protocols uh, for all of the policies and procedures. And there are two aspects to each of those. The first is to talk to senior management, uh, have you implemented these? And the second part is asking for evidence that they can uh, uh, either have delivered to them electronically or take with them if they're on site. The fifth lesson is relating to the breach notification rule. And it defines what is a breach. This is an abbreviation, but it's the acquisition, access, use, or disclosure, protected health information in a manner not permitted under the privacy rule which compromises the security or privacy of the protected health information. Um, this definition, which is quite long, is abbreviated, and there are exclusions and exigent circumstances. Uh, the complete definition can be accessed at um, um, that uh, Code of Federal Regulation site, and it's on uh, that website. If there's evidence of a breach, there are required reporting requirements unless there's a determination of a low probability of an impermissible use or disclosure of unsecured protected health information. Um, and determination of low probability is based on conducting a risk analysis that includes focusing on four required uh, factors, which are not specified here, but they are in the definition. A covered entity or business associate may proceed with notification in the absence of conducting such a risk analysis. 
So the change that occurred in the uh, after uh, September 2013 is there's a, pre a pre uh, presumption of a risk, uh, I'm sorry, of a breach in every case unless proven otherwise. And there is, as I mentioned, that safe harbor in the event of a breach if the uh, protected health information were secured through appropriate encryption described in the guidance. That guidance is very important, not only for encryption, for data at rest and data in motion, but it also tells you what's permissible for a destruction of uh, no longer uh, used uh, sensitive information or protected health information. And it's important that redaction blacking out is not an acceptable uh, way of doing that. So these are the uh, breach notification uh, rule uh, implementation specifications and standards and it's important to realize uh, in terms of training that a workforce member report a breach or a security incident, uh, incident immediately to the uh, appropriate official but doesn't and is aware that uh, there are reporting requirements but does not need the minutia of those uh, requirements that will be handled by uh, the privacy and security official. And there are other aspects uh, here as well. So it's important that they read through and see the policies and procedures, but to focus on those uh, principles, that those three principles of confidentiality, uh, integrity, and availability in those definitions uh, going forward. So a breach may be a privacy breach or a security incident. Should privacy and security officials should emphasize in its lesson that a workforce member that is aware of or discovers a breach should contact each official immediately and provide in writing information pertaining to the breach that is known. The privacy or security official is appropriate should immediately assess the circumstances of the breach and strengthen defenses to avoid a recurrence. Uh, you have to go back to the risk analysis um, uh, post-breach or incident. And then what's important is that uh, the privacy or security official access OCR's breach notification website for information on timely reporting of the breach to affected individuals and to the secretary uh, at HHS. So uh, just to recap before uh, you have any question, there are five key attributes for achieving safeguard compliance. Designated privacy and security officials, and if it's a small organization, uh, can be the same individual. Uh, single practice uh, dentists and physicians frequently do that. Uh, conducting a written risk analysis, and it must be reviewed and updated periodically. Implementing safeguard policies and procedures um, to compliance with the standards and tailored to findings from the risk analysis and accessible to all workforce members. Since we're focusing on training here, training of workforce members on those safeguard policies and procedures where there's awareness and understanding of the safeguards with sanctions for violation violations and then maintaining written documentation of safeguard actions and they can, uh, can be, and we recommend electronic and retained from six years from the last action. And then finally, uh, most effectively uh, taught, uh, we're talking about tra safeguard training, is most effectively taught by privacy and security officials when risk analysis is finished and policies and procedures are tailored with risk analysis findings. It's most effectively learned, as we've learned, when the focus is on these essential principles and definitions, and workforce members are directed to privacy or security official when there's any question that arises as to appropriate action on their part. It's most effectively implemented when workforce members have immediate electronic access to enforce policies and procedures. And a um, covered entity or business associate is most likely to avoid a privacy breach or a security incident when workforce members participate together and mutually support each other in safeguard awareness training to manage threats and vulnerabilities as part of a risk mitigation strategy 
for sustaining the future of their businesses. And I want to mention uh, there were two um, resolution agreements in the last month in uh, February and uh, both of these were quite costly and um, uh, likely to um, impair the sustainability of the future of those businesses. So it's important to invest uh, in training going forward. And our entire package um, uh, goes for um, uh, through the end of this month, uh, 449. It will be going up once uh, April 1 cuts here to 499. But you can go to the site and download all sorts of samples um, uh, that shows you what, what this um, uh, covers and how it all links together through those uh, in uh, um, column one of all of the uh, exhibits that I showed you. So that's the presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Ed, for that great presentation. I do have some questions here in the queue. Uh, first one, if you combine first name, last initial, and birth date in a limited geographic area, would that be a violation? Yes. Okay. Another comment, Texas's rule is training must be done in 90 days and retraining as needed, not every two years. Uh, then that has been a, a change in what the law was originally passed as, or the reg. Okay. Regarding the 50 years for records, this just means if your organization keeps the record for that amount of time, the HIPAA rights that are in place are kept for that long, correct? Uh, repeat that, please. Regarding the 50 years for records, this just means if your organization keeps the record for that amount of time, the HIPAA rights that are in place are kept for that long, correct? It does not mean you have to keep patient records for that long. Uh, what, what it means is they cannot be um, um, uh, disclosed or given access to uh, inappropriately for 50 years. Okay. Can you recommend a risk analysis tool or or point to a website where we can find one? A, a risk analysis what? A risk analysis tool. A tool. We have it as part of our um, a hip integrity package. It's uh, a tabular. Uh, and it's gotten very high regard in terms of ease of use. It's written in plain language. It uh, goes through nine sets of tables, uh, starts very simply, and in table nine, uh, you will have identified um, the uh, mitigation strategies that you do not have in effect uh, presently, and it's available. You can see a sample, uh, download the sample uh, introduction. Um, and take a look at it. Can you talk about patient reviews and photos on the practice or hospital Facebook page? Uh, yes, a photo is one of the um, of the uh, uh, 18 identifiers and um, even though it's there alone on a practice page that is construed as protected health information, and, and I'll, um, if it were, say, an oncology practice or a practice that specialized in managing HIV and you had a picture out there, uh, it's that association uh, with the records that uh, uh, makes it uh, protected health information. Next question, I will be retiring and leaving my position. Once I leave, how long does my personal risk or liability last for any breaches or problems? Uh, there's insufficient information for me to answer that. However, if there's been no breach or security incident and you go, 
I, I think you would be more or less in the clear unless there was something that you did uh, prior to that could be determined to be um, your fault. That much more information would be needed to make a determination. Okay. Any specific security strategy for third-party health information security? Um, I don't understand the question. So, repeat the question. Let me see if I can. Okay. Any specific security strategy? So any specific strategy for third-party health information security? Um, in terms of policies and procedures, um, this HIPAA integrity package that we put together that links risk analysis to policies, procedures, to training is going to cover that aspect of it. However, there are technology issues related to uh, networks, systems, application, devices, and media that have built-in security capabilities. And one of the, uh, and I just briefly touched on it, I've gone through it in much more depth than other uh, seminars, but with the meaningful use uh, risk analysis, um, what that, uh, you have to, uh, a, um, someone participating in that program would have to attest that they've done a risk analysis and have those protections in place. Those protections really relate to having the electronic capabilities as required, like for audit and so forth, turned on on your electronic systems. So there are aspects to this. One, one is the policies and procedures that we talk about, and some of those relate to like uh, login uh, attempts, having passwords in place, automatic logoffs, et cetera. That ties into technology, but you really need both. The important thing is to talk to your hardware and software vendors uh, about those aspects of it. Thanks, Ed. Do you need an authorization before a patient puts a review or posts a note on the hospital's Facebook page? Do you need, well, you need a, um, say that again. Do you need an authorization before a patient puts a review or posts a note on the hospital's Facebook page? Yes, there's a, a set of forms uh, and there's called patient portals that um, you have to consent to be able to uh, communicate information electronically uh, as a patient and of a hospital or a physician or a, a dentist uh, generally has those uh, when a new patient uh, comes in or increasing, excuse me, increasingly I'm seeing uh, uh, providers uh, updating that information on an annual basis and that may be required under certain circumstances such as Medicare. Great, another question. You mentioned all staff must be trained in security regulation including malicious software. Must staff be trained in the security regulation even if they do not have access to or use a computer and they have been trained in the privacy and breach notification regulations? If, if they're not using electronic systems with electronic protected health information, which is becoming increasingly rare, uh, then no, they would not have to have uh, that specific training. The security rule really focuses on uh, the work functions of people who are dealing with those uh, protect, electronic protected information sets uh, on a daily basis. Okay, last question. When a contract bid is accepted with a two-year renewal option, does a BAA need to be done at each renewal as well? Uh, what's a CAA? Uh, BAA. I'm assuming that's a business associate agreement. Oh, BAA. Okay, uh, BAA. Um, a bit. Uh, say again, please. Uh, the answer is yes. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and we have we have a ton of questions for you, Ed, and I will make sure and email them to you so that way you can follow up with folks. A lot of them are um, very detailed and very specific, so I want to make sure that you you will be getting all of the questions. You can follow up with folks individually to help, but I'd like to thank you for this fantastic presentation. I'd like to thank all of our attendees for joining us today, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your week. Or is there anything else you'd like to share with us, Ed? No, thanks, Sam, and thank you all for uh, uh, participating.